Okay, members, so you're welcome then to this morning's meeting, and we have. Um, apologies, sorry. Oh, right, okay. But it was really just sort of do the, the formal opening then. Apologies. I just did. Oh, right, you did move that. Okay. Okay, so um, obviously today's today's briefing, we were having our departmental briefing from roads, procurement, um, planning, maintenance, and flagship um, projects. We don't have any apologies. Um, we have addressed um, chairs, persons, business in, uh, in private. Um, just moving, now that we're moving into summer recess, it is usual that the committee delegates authority to the chair and the deputy chair to deal with any FOI requests received during the recess period. And it'll be for the chair and deputy chair then to submit views on releasing or withholding information in any non-routine or contentious FOI requests. If there are any such requests, the committee will be advised at the first meeting back in September. Um, just a, a question in relation to that. Would that, would that happen frequently? No. Or we're, is this really unusual that yes. that would be an issue? So just for to... Put members' minds at rest. Members content? Agreed. Okay, thank you. Moving then to draft minutes at page six, and uh, the meeting, uh, the minutes of the meeting of the 17th of June. Are members content? Agreed. Thank you. Going then to matters arising, um, are there any issues coming out of the meeting of the 17th of June which members wish to make comment on? You'll find at page 17 um, the outstanding committee requests for information. And again, do members have any comments or issues? Again, we're still waiting for a response from the 3rd of we April. Have the one in. We yes, have that. That's been received. Okay. Moving then to our next item, which is the departmental briefing. Um, you'll find that at page 25 of your packs and for members information hand so we'll be recording the meeting we'll be welcoming um, mr. John Irvine who from the department and mr. Connor Lockery from the department as well You're both very welcome thank you very much morning. for joining morning. us this morning, morning. Um, and obviously we had this has been rescheduled from before, so um, I suppose a little bit time, a little time has passed um, since um, we intended to initially speak to you. Um, if you'd like to open up with um, some comments, and uh, members will follow with um, some questions. Okay, so uh, good morning, and thanks for the opportunity to come to the committee. Um, so we've given you a, a briefing paper, and, and maybe just to introduce the paper. Um, uh, so. The part of the FI that we work in is the Roads Authority for Northern Ireland. Uh, we are responsible for the management, the maintenance and the development of the network, as well as the delivery of active travel and transport schemes, and that includes the second phase of uh, Belfast Rapid Transit. Um, so there are three directorates uh, that, that deal with those areas of work. Uh, Connor is Network Services, which is kind of the day-to-day -day operations. I deal with major projects and procurement, and our colleague Deirdre, who unfortunately can't be here today, um, she's off ill at the minute, uh, deals with the engineering side. So uh, Connor and I will, will, will cover the engineering directorate uh, as part of this presentation. So as I've said in the paper, we have about uh, 1,600 staff, including 400 industrials. And to, to, we've given you some information around uh, some issues around procurement, maintenance, flagship schemes, and, and planning. So that's that's a high level overview of the paper. And uh, maybe Connor could take you through his director yep. briefly, and then uh, I'll take you through mine, and then we'll maybe Thank you. see where that takes us. Okay, um, Connor Lahr, I'm director of network services uh, within DFI, responsible for the day to day development, management and maintenance of the, the road network, including management of the two DBFO packages. I'm based in the DFI headquarters in Clarence Court, and we have four divisional headquarter offices based in Belfast, Doma, the Gavin, Korean. And they're supported by 17 section offices that's located uh, right across uh, Northern Ireland. And it's from there that uh, many of the network maintenance functions are managed. So from these offices, we manage and maintain the public road network, including management of street lighting, winter service, emergency planning. 
we carried improvements to the network, as John has said, ranging from major road schemes through to local transport and safety schemes. And these offices are the main point of contact for road users and their representatives. Within the divisions, we also carry out the development, control and private streets functions. And based in Eastern Division with the Traffic Control Centre, TACC, where we managed uh, network telematics, and there's 175 cameras in there across the province, mostly in Belfast, and those are monitored to allow traffic management and fault reporting. So much of what we do within network services is dictated by budgets. And this year, resource budgets are such that we can continue to provide the same level of service as last year across the routine maintenance functions of pothole repair, grass cutting and weed spraying. So that's two grass cut, one gully empty, full weed spraying program. And there's additional funding this year, and that will help in the areas of sign uh, and road markings and maintenance, bridge maintenance and safety barrier. And importantly, this year, the Minister has allocated funding to allow a full street lighting repair service. This has to be welcome, been different from last year because we were relying on in your bidding, so that's certainly uh, very welcome from our side. On the capital side, in sticking with street lighting, um, 8 million has been allocated to LED lighting. This acknowledges the financial and environmental benefits associated with this work, and that will see about another 37 street lighting yeah, units replaced with LED lighting, and that will get us, I think, or 29% at the minute, that will take us up to late 30%, which is, which is good. The ageing street lighting stock has also been recognised and 14 million has been allocated to this function and this will allow about 7,000 columns to be replaced. And again, that's a significant increase from, from last year. On the structural maintenance side, uh, we'll all be aware that the Barton Review and the NIAO audit recommend that we need about 143 million pound per year to properly maintain the road network. And this year, the Minister has maintained the recent levels of investment and allocated £75 million to structural maintenance. And of that, some £10 million has been allocated to a rural roads fund, allowing divisions to target those rural roads in, in greatest need. Network Service is also responsible for taking forward local transport and safety measure schemes within the division, and £7 million has been allocated to these functions this year. And this includes £2 million for part-time, 20 mile per hour speed limits at schools, and we're hoping to deliver around 100 schools. That we're hoping about 100 schools will benefit from that uh, initiative this year. Network services. We also play a key role in taking forward the greener agenda as we uh, move into post-COVID recovery. With officials generally providing advice and proposed schemes, working with other key partners to implement solutions that best meet the needs of the, the, the various stakeholders. Outside of the maintenance function, the four roads divisions are statutory consultees uh, within the planning process, providing consultation responses to planning authorities on traffic progression and road safety aspects of plan applications. And across um, all divisions, we deal with about 10,000 statutory consultations um, every year. And lastly, the division has um, it's, it's, it's team is a team its division is a team responsible for the adoption of, of private streets, which is, uh, really falls out of the, the planning process. That's a quick summary of network services. On, on Deirdre's side, then, Deirdre's uh, quite a large portfolio. You'll have seen in, in the, the, the briefing that came up, and it's the health and safety poly, policy and advice, general traffic and development policy, management of internal contractor and internal uh, design team on-street parking restrictions and enforcement, blue badges, our claims unit, lands, and the Strangford Ferry Service all sit uh, under Deirdre. So that sort of takes on the major projects and procurement sort of falls on. So um, briefly then, my responsibility is the delivery of um, the roads programme, which could be sort of uh, subdivided into maybe new decade, new approach type schemes, which is A5, A6, York Street, A1 junctions, and then other SRI schemes, which would be Ballinahinch Bypass, Inniskill, and Cookstown, Buncrana, and Cornamuck, there are the ones in the development programme. So I'm responsible for, for taking those forward, uh, together with the uh, three infrastructure projects in the city deal, which is Belfast Rapid Transit 2, uh, Lagan. Uh, pedestrian and cycle bridge and Newry Southern Relief Road. So all of those schemes are at various stages of development and uh, my director is responsible for taking those, those forward. Um, we're also responsible for uh, a park and ride programme 
uh, and uh, there, uh, the Minister has allocated £4 million pounds for this year to take some schemes forward there. Um, and uh, another big area of my work is uh, procurement. Uh, so uh, I am the head of procurement for the uh, Roads and Rivers COP, which is a centre of procurement expertise. And we take forward uh, all the procurement, uh, all the various contracts of supplies and services and construction that allows the organisation to deliver everything from strategic roads to all the maintenance stuff to the, you know, the fleet requirements of our industrial workforce. So that's uh, it's a bit more detail in the paper. Uh, but that's that's a brief overview of what I, what I, I do. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think we, we all recognise that investment in our road network is really critical really for uh, as an economic driver and also for the general well-being of, of our residents and I mean certainly I think probably everyone in this room will have had most days some kind of complaint in relation to a pothole or some type, type of, of maintenance which is required around around the road network be that even um, street lighting or, um, or, or grass cutting. Obviously there have been a number of reports be it Snaith, Barton and the NIO um, report and they all have similar conclusions in relation to lack of investment and poor value for money. Um, I would just be interested to know, and you, you may have, you may not be able to comment in relation to the audit office report, um, but sort of what the department has done in order to be able to address some of the recommendations and conclusions which have come out of, of each of those reports. Yeah, I don't have the recommendations in front of me, but certainly there's I think there's five recommendations out of each. You know, and there are all sorts of things, uh, actions there for us around. You know, a lot of it's financial, a lot of it's gathering information that we have around the road work, the road network, around uh, how we allocate between trunk road and other roads. So, so some of them are taken forward or have already been uh, have been dealt with the shorter term ones, but a number of them are. Sort of more medium and long term, but they're, they're currently being taken forward. Okay, and um, we, we had a, an interesting um, discussion last week, which you'll be aware of, with regards to MPA ANI, um, and very much around the um, around budget and and the challenges that there have been, obviously not only in the amount of budget, but obviously in, in, in how it's been allocated, maybe on an annual basis as opposed to to longer term, which obviously impacts on on, on planning. Um, just from a, a department's perspective. That obviously will be a benefit then to you as to how you move forward with a number of the schemes because many of them have sort of stopped and started at various stages, particularly within the planning. I'm just really looking for, for comment with regards to how we move forward um, and trying to meet the challenges, obviously, that, that industry and con the construction industry particularly has. So just, just on, on a general point, clearly multi-year budgets uh, allow th will allow a minister to plan uh, into the future. Uh, a lot of, particularly on the strategic road schemes, there, there's quite a long lead-in uh, when you go through the various phases. So there's, uh, you, you have a, a development phase, a procurement phase, and a construction phase. And uh, uh, I suppose budget certainly into the future allows a minister to plan and prioritise better. Uh, from a maintenance perspective, yeah, yeah. From my side, certainly, you know, getting relying on linear funding isn't. The, uh, the best way um, for us to operate for our contractors, you know, I think I, I mentioned street lighting earlier, where we had money earlier in the year and then uh, the, the money ran out. Contractors had to lay off staff and then we get money later in the year, so they have to get them back in again. So from, I can understand fully from a business uh, perspective how that that's difficult. So this year is much better that we've got uh, financial certainty in the year, and that's much better better for them. Equally in the structural maintenance, you know, we have the 75 million allocation at the outset, um, so that certainly provides a, a level of continuity now. So, um, forward in the, the coming months, which I would have thought the industry would would, would welcome. Okay. Um, Barton he, uh, um, concludes that obviously timely intervention is highly cost-effective, with late intervention costing as much as four times the optimum, and then goes on obviously to say in relation to potholes um, and obviously the result in damage to motorised vehicles, which in itself can be costly. The potential consequences for cyclists are much more severe with the threat of personal injury and even loss of life. The policy of choosing not to repair all potholes on routes that may be used by cyclists is at the least contrary to the executive's wider PFG objectives um, relating to encouraging active travel. Again, this issue around you know, insurance claims and so on and not addressing um, faults in a timely manner is incredibly costly. 
Um, do you have details in relation to um, the cost for, for of claims uh, within the department? I, I don't have them to hand, but, but certainly, you know, they're typically three, four, five million of that uh, sort of order. Probably, a, 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 probably at the order of about four million a year. Yeah. Um, I think just on your, you know, it, it probably doesn't say it in the Barton report, but a stitch in time saves nine is, is quite a good way to look at this. Mm -hmm. But um, if you can, uh, you know, on the road network, uh, you, water and frost and, and, and ice does the biggest damage. So if, if you can close something up quickly, then you reduce the long term cost. So, uh, you know, uh, Barton, that's essentially what Barton is saying is that if you can deal with it, uh, early, then it's better value for money. But obviously, dealing with that and early requires funding to do so. Yes. And that's where the, the rural roads fund is a help because um, typically you know, you'll target those roads that, that are the busiest. But when you look at uh, condition of rural roads, some of them mightn't be the busiest, <coughs> busiest, but they might be in the worst condition. So that fund allows us to. Um, to do works on those roads, which yeah, I appreciate. Perhaps if you, maybe you could come back just with information, just in relation to claims. Um, yeah, to that, 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 that should be straightforward. I, I, we just, I just don't have it. Okay, um, and just uh, um, John, we, we've had this discussion before in relation to coastal erosion and obviously maintaining um, sort of the coastal road network and the challenges that there are, particularly along, along the north coast. Uh, that coast road, which obviously um, Mr. Heldich, Mr. Beggs, be aware of, but also around my own constituency around Portify Road and so on too. Uh, I'm just interested around the, the Rural Roads Fund. Is is that is that a, is that money going to be targeted in relation to that around coastal erosion, or is there a separate piece of or a separate pot um, with regards to those particular roads? Well, uh, I would say it. You know, it it could be used out of the rural roads, or it could be used out of the the the. the the residual budget, you know, the 75 million, you know, the 65 million, if you take away the 10. So that'll go out to divisions and they'll obviously prioritise schemes within their area. And, uh, and that could well include um, schemes within, you know, the peninsula and all the rest of it that, that, that need to be done. Yeah, I'm, I'm focusing on, on those roads particularly because those are ongoing maintenance issues as opposed to um, you know, a one-off that's maybe treated once every few years, um, and obviously there's a, there's a, a very targeted piece of work required in those areas. So, so this is you know uh, the maintenance of coastal roads and, and sea walls is, is a subset of general maintenance, and you know it's all about uh, you know there are twenty five thousand kilometres of roads in Northern Ireland, and this is all about maintaining that asset and, and keeping the asset secure, you know for the future. And, and again, it all comes down to priorities and and funding. And, and you know that that's uh, you know it, it's important, but there's a certain slice of a cake uh, in terms of what's allocated and resource to go round, and and Connor and his team have to prioritise that uh, within the budgets they have available. Is that a fair yeah, enough you know, comment? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's it's where those particular schemes sit in comparison to others in terms of relative priority. Okay, I appreciate that. And just before I open up, obviously you, you've referenced in your paper the other strategic road schemes, which include Balnahinch, Shenaskillen, Cookstown, Bancrana, and Cornamuck. And there really isn't very much information in relation to any of those on that paper. And would it be possible for us to get further information with regards to um, where we are in each of those and where the department is in each of those schemes? So I could probably give you something now. Okay. okay. So as I said earlier, they're all at the various stages of development and, and the minister's allocated uh, some money and asked us to push forward on the development stage to get these, uh, to move these along. Um, and we'll be engaging in the minister with the minister in sort of in the coming weeks and months to, to, to you know, bring her up to speed on these. Um, uh, Essentially, uh, work in reverse order. The, the one at Corn and Muck is, is very well developed, and it's probably what I would call procurement ready. Uh, Cookstown and Bancrana are working their way through the scheme development uh, at the minute. And uh, what we do is, you, you, with any road scheme, as you develop it, you, you work from a wide corridor to a narrow corridor to prepared option, and then you go out to uh, public consultation on draft orders for the scheme. So, in terms of um, uh, Buncran and Cookstown, that, that they're moving along, and uh, middle of next year might be in a position where the minister could consider where we've got to on that. Um, uh, 
Enniskillen is probably a bit more further advanced in that uh, we've got to the stage where uh, we probably need to sit down and, and allow the Minister to consider the next steps in relation to the publication of draft orders. And, and Balna Hinch is probably roughly in the same place. It's, it's quite well developed, but the statutory processes aren't complete. Uh, maybe you know, A5, A6, do you, do you want me to... I'm, I'm conscious that there may be okay, others yeah. in the in the meeting that may want to ask specifically about those who don't really want to deal, steal their thunder. Um, and I, I do appreciate that we'll probably be doing a bit of a tour of Northern Ireland um, during this um, this session. So I'll move then to Mr Boylan. Thank, Thank you, you. Chair. You're, Connor, you're very welcome. John, thank you for your presentations. Um, just, just a wee bit of clarity, Connor, on the... Um, we had the recovery fund and the rural, the rural uh, roads funds, one and the same, similar programmes, yeah? Yeah, the, yes. Yeah. I mean, I asked in the context of those £25 million over the last two years for the recovery fund, and I know that um, the minister, previous minister, Chris Hazard, which I thought was a good scheme, and... We've received 10 million this year. I mean, obviously we're fighting hard as much money as possible, but there's, there's a slight there's a slight decrease in for this year in the last two years. Yes, it's the same program principle. It, it, it's been yeah, it's been it's the same program. As, I suppose where we're better this year is that you know, a couple of years ago we had a very bad winter, which put the rural roads in very um, poor condition. So there's probably more money allocated at that time because we were dealing with a bigger problem. We had a milder winter this year, so we think. Sound. But we listen, and, and the chair has mentioned all the reports, and I've been on previous committees, and back and forward, and back on this and now, and I know, I know most of the reports. The, the the slightly concerning thing, the one good thing is the the major trunk network is in good condition. That's I said that in a recent report. I'm wondering now, and I'm, I just want to use this one road in particular. I could use a number of roads. I could use a number of border roads in my own constituency, but. One road in particular. Now, I do I do welcome the patching that that's been carried out and it's, it's, it's secured a number of those roads at the minute. But the overall status of some of the roads would take more than just patching. And, and I'll use the Tunnel of Wood Road. I'd say Katie Tunnel of Wood. T U L L Y N A W O O T. And so roads have been written. The minister is well aware of it. But I'm going to use that as an example. There's a number of roads that's been patched, which is fair enough. But there's some roads that that is long term. The long term condition of those roads needs to be looked at. And I'm just wondering. And I mentioned the context of we'd concentrated on the main trunk network for years. Now we're getting a bit of money. And you mentioned this, the 65 million that's left over. Um, I'll, I can write to you in, in consideration of some of those roads that I would like to see. <coughs> um, besides the patch work, which is appreciated, but there are roads out there where, you know, the foundation of those roads now, and, and most of them in the rural areas, that there may be all the considerations given to them. And I appreciate that the money is given down to the local divisions, and it's up to them to make those decisions. But I will say, I'll, I'll certainly send an email to you, but I just, want to, I just want to use that as an example. The other one, and I want to use it in relation to the um, and it's, I know it's not specifically part of your section, but it's, it's something you need to consider. Um, we had less traffic on the roads in May, but still we had double the deaths on the roads, unfortunately. And I mentioned the context of the likes of the A1, because the A1 primarily, there was a lot of issues in terms of road safety with it. So my, my question is, just a wee update on where the A1 is, and the works with it, and the public inquiry and everything, but also in the context of uh, discussions with the, the, the road safety area of the department in terms of getting the message out. You know what I mean? Because, <coughs> like I say, the month of May in, in particular, less traffic and there was, and there was double the deaths on the road for that. So in terms of your engagement with the road safety element of it all, but, but just those two, would like comments on those two elements. Have you been paying you? So um, on the A1 uh, Junctions, so yeah. it's a scheme to grade separate four of the junctions between uh, Hillsborough, south of Hillsborough and, and Loch Brickland, and then um, uh, close up the uh, put a barrier uh, down the centre and, and close up the gaps, and that will clearly uh, have a significant safety benefit. So there's a public inquiry held for that in March, and we're currently awaiting the inspector's report. Uh, and we anticipate that maybe uh, in August, 
and at that stage then uh, you know departmental officials would consider that and then present it to the minister for consideration and in terms of taking that forward next steps so um uh, we, we have to wait. It's an, it's an independent inquiry, uh, and we have to wait to see what the outcome of that is before deciding the next steps. Um, I know certainly in terms of interim steps, the, the division has, 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 has we, we've done some uh, uh, elements of the safety fence in, in the centre uh, and tried to you know, take measures to uh, improve safety, but ultimately, it'll be the overall scheme will have the, 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 the deliver the benefits. Uh, you know, in terms of the wider road safety, it's, it's a separate part of the department. Yeah, we're, we're all one department, yeah. but uh, we all, uh, you know, uh, uh, sing off the same hymn sheet. Uh, road safety is about uh, engineering, education, and enforcement. The police do the enforcement; we do the engineering. And our road safety people are very focused on getting messages out to uh, ensure. Uh, that that, that uh, people understand you know, all the various risks and pay attention and uh, don't drink and drive whatever. So so we can certainly take the message back to them that you're, you're focused on that and and, uh, and uh, to ensure that that, that um, those messages uh, you know are, keep being reinforced. It was just to learn over the COVID period. You know, sadly, that's yeah. that's been the fact. In the yeah. Uh, in, in relation to your other comment, then you know we accept fully. You know, Barton and the auditor saying we need 143 million. We're getting 75. So you know we know there's more good and can be doing. Um, so where the Tully and the Whip Road, and the things, but I become I'll, familiar with it. Don't worry, no more. Yeah, but but certainly I'll pass that to the division. They're now developing the programmes for this year, and if you sort of send me an email, I'll send you an email. I'll no get that passed to the division for consideration. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you, Ms. Kimmins. Thank you, Chair, and thanks, uh, John and Connor, for, for your presentation. Um, just, I suppose, leading on or following on from what uh, my colleague said there around the A1, it's, I actually spoke with the public inquiry, and um, it's something I've, I've, I've been working on as well. So, it's just to say, following that, is, is it almost shovel ready, or where are we at with that? Is there, are we exploring any other possible safety improvements for, for that scheme? So, uh, it's not shovel ready so what will happen is after the inquiry uh we will have to take on board what the inspector says and then it will move you know depending on the outcome of that the minister will make a decision uh that will also be funding dependent um uh, and i suppose the depending on what happens in the next logical phase is to move into procurement so there is some time before we get to the shovel ready stage but uh, as, as I said to the member, you know, I know the division are considering and have considered interim measures, and, and there's a few things on the table that, that uh, you know, they, you know, in the normal course of events, you know, as, as managers of the, the network, the you know, divisions and traffic sections are always looking at uh, measures that can improve safety on the network. So, so whilst the overall scheme can deliver the, the, the best benefits, there are possibly measures that can be. Uh, you know, add it to the measures that we've already taken uh, to improve safety, and, and that's maybe something uh, that will, will, will the minister be able to consider in the mix with uh, once we get the outcome of the uh, inquiry and uh, as she decides the, the next steps on this. Yeah. So I suppose what you're saying is that you know, easier things that are able to do in the short term that they, they, they're trying to look at. And then the bigger picture stuff is supposed to be yeah. considered by the minister. And, and I think, to be fair, there is a lot. There is some short term stuff has been done, and yeah. I think they've done what yeah. they can. I suppose the question is, can they do any more? Yeah. Uh, and, and again, you know, the teams would be focused on this, uh, and to do what they can in advance of, of of potentially a bigger, you know, a bigger scheme coming in. But, you know. The next sort of key milestone is the inspector's report in August, and that will then, you know, you know, from from that presumably in discussions with the minister, a strategy can be developed yeah. and evolved. Yeah, no, that's good. I suppose, like and I've said before, I'd say it's probably one of the most dangerous roads we have here in the north. You know, it's it's pretty bad when you look at the, the figures. So it's good to see that there's a, a, a concerted effort on that. And I think <coughs> I think to be, you know, the minister is very focused on this this yeah. particular one. It's it's. Uh, uh, part of new decade, new approach is connecting Belfast and Dublin strategy. So the minister is very, very focused on this. Uh, but I say the next milestone is uh, probably in August. Okay, no, that's fair enough. Uh, just a couple other um, things, John. 
Um, and, and you had mentioned in the, in the brief it talks about the 20 mile power zones um, for about 100 schools in the north and that's very very welcome and it's something I suppose in my own constituency it's been a big issue and I've been um, lobbying for that as well. Just in terms, because I, I, on the announcement of that I've contacted the department to see if there's a list already but they've said they're working on it. Um, it's just to see how is that being determined in terms of what schools will be eligible because um, you know, I suppose like all elected reps we probably have a list the length of our arm that could that we feel would be um, eligible for it. Yeah, I mean, I would have thought it's, it's all schools are probably eligible. It's which ones are the top, or the highest yeah. priority at this minute in time. And there is an assessment process. Okay. It's traffic volumes, traffic speeds, uh, collisions. So at the minute, so, so divisions do have lists, but we, we need to make sure that all schools are covered in that list. So yeah. we're taking a bit of time now to make sure that we look at all the schools because there's a lot of requests coming in, as you suggest. Uh, we do the assessments, we prioritise them, and we'll obviously do what we can afford to do this year. But you, you know, it, it may well be that you know next year that this can all be continued. Can so we're not saying there's no school. Um, we will be saying uh, shouldn't be done as a yeah. relative priority. In, in my own experience, I'm thinking of even particularly rural schools where there's maybe not a speed limit on the road there, and that's been causing a big issue. So um, it was just to see whether that was something that would be part of that assessment process. It certainly is. Yeah, traffic speed is is one um, yeah. of the assessment criteria, and traffic volume is another. So it may be that it's up in the speed and down in the, the volumes, you know. So it's, um, but that's the process that's there, and yeah. basis. Um, and I suppose in, in, in the brief as well, they mentioned about street lighting repairs. Do, will that include cl column replacements? I know that's something that's been it's quite yeah, dangerous. Well, column, yeah, the, uh, the street lighting repairs is what we're funded for this year for the, sort of the repair of the outages. Hmm. Um, in terms of column replacement, the $14 million this year for column replacements okay. that allows to do about $7,000. Um, that's better than last year. Yeah. But we have a very aging uh, light in stock, so it's something that we that it's targeted. And 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 then I suppose it's 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 great that there is an enhanced road maintenance budget. Um but as we you know it and it is very limited and we understand that. But where has the minister redirected the funding from? Is that do we know? I, well, I, I'm not in a position to answer that question, I just uh, I know what has certainly come my direction. But yeah. Uh, you, you know what it's been competing with. It was, so there's water in there, translink in there. So there's a whole lot of competing uh, demands yeah. within the, the department. But the structural maintenance is the same allocation as last year. Yeah. Uh, so. Okay. No, that's fair enough. I suppose we're well aware of all the, the competing. I suppose it was particularly over the last few months we've heard from from uh, all those departments. Just the last question. Um, you mentioned, John, about the Southern Relief Road, yep. um, and I had raised it back in February with the Minister. There's, there's quite a strong lobby there for it to be a lifting bridge, if possible, because I know I represent Newry, so you know there's a, a, quite a lot of concern within the community that it will close off that, um, you know, the waterway there at the Albert Basin. So it was just the Minister had said at that time that she would. Um, come down to Newry and meet with the, the groups involved in that waterways and things like that. Um, and obviously COVID has, has cropped up in the middle of all this. So it was just to see, is that something that's still being considered and is it a possibility that the minister or you know the officials will will engage with the wider community there? Because I see it's, it is really building momentum now as we go through all of this. Yeah, so um, uh, whilst we've taken the, the design forward as a fixed bridge, it's yeah. not decided as a fixed bridge. Okay. And I think the minister indicated that committee, uh, this committee in, in March, that or maybe it was earlier actually, that she wanted to engage with stakeholders. Yeah. That still is the position. Okay, no, that's fair enough because I think there was a concern following um, her statement last week, just had, you know, around, um, she just mentioned the Southern Relief Road and things like that, and there was no. Kind of reference to what was happening, uh, so it was just it was just as a query it's come up. So with what we've been doing, uh, we've been taking forward the development of the scheme, uh, but uh, there's no decisions being taken uh, in terms of the fixed lifting, uh, okay. and, and that will be uh, considered and, and uh, you know as part of the next steps. Okay, no, that's great. Thank you, John, and thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, just a couple of questions. In relation to a number of the sort of more high-profile projects, you know, the flagship projects, and 
other projects that you've been pursuing as major infrastructure developments. A lot of them have been subject to um, judicial review and have been delayed as a result of those judicial re reviews. Is your feeling that the legislation in place around um, the delivery of these projects is fit for purpose, or if there's a need to, to have a look at that? Because I'm just conscious of, for example, the A5 has been delayed um, quite significantly as a result of legal challenges. And I would declare for the record that I was previously an employee of TransLink, member of Argent North Edinburgh Council, and my stepfather is a quality manager for the A6 project for, uh, done given bypass. So, uh, in terms of legislation, uh, you know, so the, the roads projects are taken forward under roads legislation, uh, and we, you know, we live in a democratic society, and people can challenge that, and, and that's fine. Uh, I, I, it's hard for me to comment on your, you know, is the legislation fit? The legislation is the legislation. We try and take it through. Um, so that, that's a difficult one. But I do know that the um, NIAO have done a report on, on major projects, and they were kind of focused on that. And that's that. That maybe <coughs> that might be the focus of, of other work for, for NIAO. But it, it's hard for me to comment on whether something is fit for purpose or not. Um, it is conscious of the fact that, as a result of the situation we have at the moment, we've got a number of major flagship projects, York Street Interchange, the A5, so many are been delayed compared to the rest of the United Kingdom and other parts of Europe, and whether the situation we have at the moment needs to be reformed, and if there's a review in that, because the current situation that we have, I don't think is acceptable. I think as John said, you, you know, I'm thinking of the A5, the first one, when it was challenged on 12 grounds, you know, so the, the challenges are wide-reaching, you know, it's very difficult to, to, to plug all the gaps, and I think on, on that then, you know, 11 of them were dismissed, but there was one retained, um, you, you know, so it, it's, you know, there's, it's extremely difficult to, to cover everything, and with the democracy at run, you know, people will certainly look to... Explore what we have done. Okay. Um, in, in relation to the uh, ASIC project, the, the bit from um, uh, which is mentioned in the report um, from Drumahoe up to the A2 roundabout at Caw, obviously there's significant challenge around that because of the legal dump at Maboy, and I just want to see if there's a few in relation to what the timescales are for being able to, to complete that um, A6 project to take it straight through to Derry. So th th there's only been very preliminary work done on that, and like uh, you know, in terms of the development of of, of, of our road schemes, it's it's very very preliminary. So taking that forward, you know, will depend on a number of factors and, and including funding as well. So um, it's it's uh, it hasn't really advanced. They have a line, but we don't have actually a, a, a detailed. Scheme yet. Because the concern is that the A6 will then finish at Drumahoe. And you're going to have then congestion. At no, so okay. So, uh, what I've said, it's not developed. Uh, the A6 is, is uh, the part of the flagship. Yeah, yes. It includes the the whole A6, which that's the last section. Okay. But that you know, progression of that will depend on a number of factors, including funding. Um, but it's it's not as I said before. All these things are at various stages. That's 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 not very well advanced at the minute. Uh, maybe a last question. Obviously, a lot of the stuff is all very oriented around roads, and understandably, uh, in relation to the volume of traffic. Um, but the provision of segregated cycle lanes is a, a key issue. Um, there's been a lot of pop-up cycle lanes and stuff like that. But people want segregated <coughs> cycle lanes, and is that something within your remit, or if there's any plans around that? Yeah, you no, know, it's certainly something that we're <coughs> very aware of, and the minister is certainly very focused on it. And uh, you, you set up a walking and cycling champion within the department, you know, who, who is feeding in, into everything that we do. So certainly, it is uh, it's the direction of travel <coughs> going forward. And is that a given consideration in terms of these road building projects, in terms of ensuring that there is segregated? Because there was resurfacing work occurred, for example, in the Sydney bypass recently, and likely in that really at the, as part of that is sort of. Not, not great, really. It's probably the most diplomatic way to put it. Yeah, the, the cycle lane on Sydney Bypass, it, it was really what, just put back what was there before. Basically, there's a hard shoulder there. Half of it was um, lined out as a cycle lane, but obviously, if it's needed as a hard shoulder, then the cycle lane um, wouldn't be able to operate in, in those limited times. And that, that is there 
uh, both directions on Sydney bypass and it's only resurfaced that yes there were, there were some comments um, but it's uh, it, uh, the scheme just put back what was there before and uh, you know it worked well certainly for, for for years and it may not be perfect but it's a, a reasonably good solution <coughs> in the circumstances just one last question um user statutory consultation around the planning process uh, and obviously the real need to be able to turn around planning applications as quick as possible is a real concern, particularly in the economic circumstances we're in now and going into the future, so just being able to deliver that growth. Is that a resourcing concern and being able to turn around some of those planning applications as statutory consultees? Or? Well, well, certainly, um, you know, during COVID, we had a lot of people working from home, but that one area we were able to certainly keep going as fast as we can. You know, the number of applications obviously reduced, but uh, we were able to keep up with our, our outputs as normal. And there's certainly there's a piece of work going on in relation to major applications. Um, you know, they're now being identified, and we're keeping a close eye on those to make sure that those key applications that are. Um, all important, but that are even more important. Uh, they're getting a bit of priority. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hilditch. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I'm just following up on some of these these issues here. Uh, on the on the school twenty million hour potential projects. What sort of scheme is it? The full blown uh, with the flashing lights, the twenty million hour signs, and uh, illuminated and. Everything is that the sort of scheme that they're looking at, or is it simply just a signage schemes? Or um, it's not fully decided yet what, what it looks like, and it may be that there's different solutions needed at different locations. Different locations. Yeah. Um, but certainly, you know, the basic model will certainly be the 20 mile an hour signs, you know, the flashing signs with with the uh, wigwags as they call them. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's. The Going to be the basic model, and it may be some locations need a bit more than that, depending on where they are. So that's all been looked at as part of the assessment process. No, thank you. Uh, was chair spoke about the coastal roads and the erosion, uh, but sometimes the A2 sort of north of Larne would uh, be closed on a regular basis due to landslides uh, coming probably from well coming from private land. How are those matters dealt with? Is there some assistance to landowners, uh, or is it just simply coming along each time and clearing the road? And is there res a resolution to some of these issues on a sort of more longer term basis? Um, I might be to, I'm just not aware of the detail of it, and I know when, if and when they happen, we certainly do what we need to do to get you know road open again. Yeah, just yeah, yeah. It's obviously, uh, uh, again, um, you know, it's probably quite difficult to. To identify the, the areas, the highest risk areas, um, but it's not something that uh, I'm aware of the detail. But I can certainly come back to you. Okay, uh, and the rollout of the LED lighting program. Uh, what does that look like? Is there priorities for certain areas, or how does the how do you determine where you go next with that program? Well, the Typically, you know, we would replace the old footings every three or four years. Is, uh, is what their life cycle is. The, the new ones are are um, 25 years. Uh, you know, so there's significant benefits with LED lighting. But you know yourself sometimes when they're changed over. Uh, ordinary folk would be saying, "Oh, look at that! We're not getting as good a light as we had there last week." You know, sort of thing. You know, so. you know I, I can understand that. It's certainly a different light, but it's certainly a cheaper yeah, light. Yeah. Um, you know, and better light uh, environmentally. Uh -huh. um, you know, so it's it's definitely what will be taken forward. Um, so you know, so in terms of areas that you know it'll, it'll be done on an area-wide basis, and divisions would know best where, um, you know, where, where the need is. Mm -hmm. Just on parking. Uh, Restrictions and probably the legislative side of it. It does take some time to get that legislation through. Work comes here. In some cases, it's been maybe eight or nine months before it arrives here. Would you be able to tell us anything about that process, or is that with without yourselves? Or? Well, I just. Uh, I know there's schemes implemented. Uh, town centre schemes implemented. Maybe say last autumn, and we're only seeing. Now in the month of June of the following year, the, the legislation coming this far, and I just wonder, the length of time seems to be quite long. 
um, in a way that's certainly something you know because the delayed delays arising from the the COVID restriction wouldn't have helped the thing, but certainly even well, this is general, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just again, there's a lot of processes to go <coughs> through for those, and I can understand the frustration from you know from interested parties around that, but. Uh, there's processes we have to, to go through, and they just take a bit of time, unfortunately. I think just, just to add to that, certainly in terms of public realm time schemes, uh, I think there are some cases where you almost have to wait until the thing is actually constructed to make the legislation to make sure it exactly fits. Mm -hmm. now, I think that is the case. Yeah, yeah because you know, when you're doing legislation for lighting, for example, you have to specify exactly to where it starts and where it finishes. Mm -hmm. We all know when you deliver any scheme or a public realm scheme, things can sort of change yeah. and run in a wee bit. So that, you know, the, where we don't want to be is legislating for something that doesn't materialise and then having to redo it. So as John says, you really need to wait until you get certainty about it, what it looks like before you can start the process. That's maybe not at completion, it's maybe just at, at a little yeah. bit further advanced stage, but I think, uh -huh. that, I think that's maybe a relevant point. Okay, thank you. Uh, the winter programme. Uh, well, obviously, we're sitting now in the middle of summer. <laughs> Actually, we've turned around now. We're heading towards the darker nights. But uh, ha has the winter programme been sufficient over the last year or so? Uh, and how are you planning for the year ahead? In terms of funding? Yeah, yeah. Or the challenges that you face, any other? Right? Yeah, no, no the, certainly. Well, the funding for this year is that you need about, you need about £6 million. Pounds. Obviously, it depends on the winter. And there's been three million pounds set aside at this stage for for winter service, and we would hope that the additional funding will be. Mm. Um, there been a stock carried over from this winter past. Yeah, it, it is. It all. It always. You know, we we look at our stock, and but it's it's work, working quite well as far as I'm, I'm aware. Now I'm not aware of any difficulties. We we do all the tests at the start of the season. Look at stock. Look at plant. Get the rotors in place. Um, you know which. We do have to do in the summer as well, so mm. people see the gritters out in, in the summer, but you know, in late summer and wander, but it's very often it's testing the plant for the coming year. Yep, okay, thank you. And on the major sort of capital schemes, then probably <coughs> one that affects my constituency as much as any is the York Gate interchange. And oh, we, we know there was a legal challenge there, and that set that scheme back somewhat, but. Again, just in different forums, people are asking where that actually sits now, and should it not have been very simple and just gone out to tender again? And, and where, where, where does it just all sit at the minute, to be honest? So um, uh, you've mentioned the legal challenge, uh, which finished last September. Uh, so the, the team have been reviewing the procurement strategy, and that's almost coming to an end. And uh, uh, once we do that, uh, you know, the minister will have to consider the next steps. Um, ministers indicated, I think, on the record and in, in, in the assembly and oral questions, her commitment to the scheme, uh, but she still has to consider, you know, the next step. So, um, I think early July we'll have completed that little bit of work on the review of the procurement strategy, and then that will allow us to discuss the next steps with the minister. And what, what are the options? Well, uh, they just keen to go ahead with it, all right? <laughs> well, it, 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 so. The procurement strategy depends on funding. You know, so if if you if you certainly have funding, you might take a different route. If you don't have certainly have funding, so the previous strategy was a two-phase approach, uh, which was legally challenged, where you uh, develop the design and then you get a break point, uh, uh, and if money then becomes available, you can move the contract into construction. So that that was the previous strategy. Um, so we're, we're looking at that again because it was challenged, uh, not necessarily in the strategy, but maybe on. The, how the procurement was done, but you know there are probably limited options. But we thought it was incumbent on us to do that, given where we were. So when we go forward, when we are able to discuss with the minister the next steps, we have we, we've done that, and we, we can be assured that that is the best way forward. Ten months is a bit of a time to review that, is it not? Is it? Well, it, 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 so um, yes, the. Uh, People like to see work on the ground. No, I appreciate that, but uh, if you can imagine, from se the September to January, we were in the EFEF territory, and then ministers come back in. So yes, uh, uh, clearly uh, that, that that was one that, that the minister would would want to be involved in the decision going forward. But um, it's coming to a conclusion now. Okay. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Okay, thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks, John Connor. Hey, my, I want to follow up on Ms. Kimmins and Davies' point regarding our how late should I say? A LED lighting. Davies, fine. That's all right. A, you've talked about there. You've twenty nine percent completed, roughly across. Am I correct that figure across Northern Ireland? So, how much? How long have you been doing that program, and when do you see that hundred percent complete? And what's that going to gain in maintenance cost and savings on running costs? So, does the the quicker that's implemented, does it outbalance the, the maintenance cost, taking away the state columns, obviously? Yeah, the the energy, the, the LED is the, the saving in energy yeah. and saving in maintenance costs. Um, we're doing 30,000 this year, take us up to about close to 40% of the stock being done. Um, 30,000? Yeah. We're doing 30,000 lights this year. Um, so. Uh, the, the pace going forward depends on the budget allocation year on year, but certainly LEDs, there's about a 60% energy saving with them. So what we're doing this year will probably save something of the order of half a million pounds in our energy bill for next year. And what is your budget roughly for to do those 30,000? Uh, 8 million, I think that's the figure. Uh, 8 million for this year, yeah. Eight million does thirty thousand lights, giving you a saving of what? Sorry, I'm of the order of half a million this year. Okay. So when do you see, based on the, the current budget or the similar budget going forward, when do you see one hundred percent complete? Are you doing ten percent, you know, a year roughly? Well, think? that's I'd say this year. There's two hundred and ninety thousand lights. We're doing thirty thousand this year. That's two ninety to do. Yeah. No, there's two ninety in total. Okay. So um, if we're doing ten percent. Per year, for, you know, it would take us another six years at the same level of funding. Well, is that what you're aiming for? Well, that's, <coughs> you know, we're working on annual budgets, so yeah, it, yeah. it's a, a, a budgetary issue. Okay, and then just a quick point on the schools: the the two million allocation to schools or the hundred schools. Which is your figure? Are you working to the two million? Or are you working to the hundred? We're looking to. Identify and take forward a hundred at this stage. Um, we'll have to look at the detail of what's involved. Picking up on the earlier question, you know, there's different um, solutions at different schools. Uh, it's difficult to align them at the moment because we don't know exactly what schools we are and what we're doing. Um, you know, so we'll have to make a call on that later in the year once we have a bit more information. So, is that to be fair with your communication last week? And I think somebody had budgeted it's twenty thousand per school. So presume that's budgeted on the flashing light principle. Bear in mind that might be the solution at every school, because a rural road, as you know, going from 60 to 20 mightn't be a solution. You know, reducing speed from 60 to 20 at a rural school mightn't be a solution. Could it actually cause more problems. Uh, well, problem in what way? How well, you know, causing more? not always speeding traffic down from 60 to 20 isn't always a solution. You know, if you're in a town and you're 30 going to 20, it's a different speed drop. So my point is, are you basing that twenty thousand on every school getting flashing lights? To give you the hundred schools. It, it but, but it may well be, as you say, that there's different measures needed yeah. to different schools. For example, you might have more approach roads to schools, yeah. so it may be that twenty thousand could become thirty thousand. But we've got we've got to take stock once we understand exactly what we're doing, and then we'll go back to the minister with uh, what we're planning to do and what the costs are, and we'll uh, match them up. Okay, and then one on question on, on the issue of Davies not here, maybe on parking enforcement. What remit do you have in regard to local towns? You know, you get a narrow free parking, for example, Cookstown. Okay, how does that be changed till two hours, for example? There's a narrow free parking yeah. in Cookstown. I'm not aware of the detail of it. Um, I assume each each town will have to be, you know, considered and assess what its needs are. Um, you know, that would be. A decision at a local level to be taken forward. Then, um, so can that be done? Where at what point can that be done? Well, I think the, the first thing to do would be, be the divisional people would be looking at any requests to alter the the, the timings or, or or the restrictions. And um, there's pros and cons with all of these things. Uh, they would then um, prepare something based on those pros and cons. The, the, and the issue we're seeing that in person in local towns is. The pop-in shopper, as I call them, can't pop in anymore because a nerd doesn't do it. You know, so therefore, if the, the time was relaxed, we give the local shopper 
time to pop in because you know going to a shop now doesn't take five minutes anymore it takes longer mm -hmm. so a, a, a bit of relaxation possibly would be an avenue to, to give those small businesses a benefit not everybody can park you know and walk and all that so you know there's, there's an it, to look at that you know is that people parking on <coughs> yeah on, on street on street parking as they call it yeah yeah, with, uh, okay, so in Cookstown there's a... They get an hour free, they get an hour and then they're... So, hour and two, yeah. yeah. Hey, again, those are sort of things that should be raised maybe at a local level and... Uh, and, and but it's a quick process then, is that what you're telling me? Is it a quick process if that's raised locally, can that be done quickly? No, well, I would, you know, that would probably, if there are changes, it would be, require a change in legislation probably. Okay, and then with... Um, We've talked about strategic roads, and I'm not going to beat the drum anymore for the Cookstown bypass. But you know my opinion on that, so we'll leave it there. Okay, thank, thank you, you. Miss Anderson. Uh, thank you, Th thank you, uh, both John and Connor. Can I take you back to the um, A2? Uh, for some people listening to that around the Bonkana Road, it might sound like jargon when you talk about narrowing and widening, and then you, you talked about a draft order being done, and maybe mm -hmm. the end of next year. So am I assuming by the end of next year that the consultation on the A2 will be done with the Minister for consideration to move forward? So uh, uh, what we're saying is that the, the scheme is being developed and being refined at the minute, and probably towards the middle of next year, we'd be in a position to uh, put in front of the Minister uh, draft orders, and then uh, she would decide uh, next steps after that. So What are the next steps? So, for a scheme like that, uh, it's probably uh, more than likely a public inquiry. Um, I, just, and that's, I, I just thought that might be where we're going so that, here. Yeah, so we, we talk a lot about statutory yeah, processes, yeah. but that, that's in, in the statute. Uh, uh, but for, for a, a scheme probably <coughs> as complex as that, that's, that's probably, you, know, you can't ever never say never. But yeah, I, well, I think when you're making an likely. announcement as was made around these SRIs, it would be good to have some information attached to it because people get their hopes built up that, for instance, A2 Bunkran, and I'm sure maybe for some of the other roads, that we might be heading towards construction at some point relatively soon. And then we're hearing that if, as part of this process, and that's why I referred to the, the jargon that people do not capture when such statements are being released, that really what we're, not ta we're talking about, the, for instance, with regards to Bonkrana, that not happening during this mandate. So, so that's up to whoever it is in the next mandate, and we'll have to deal, we'll have so, to deal so, with that then. So what, just to come back on that, so what, what the Minister, I said earlier, we have a number of schemes that are various stages of development. The minister has asked us to keep advancing those, the development stage, but beyond the development stage, there are other stages. So that, that's that's where we are in the process. Along the piece of string, um, Greenway agendas. You, you mentioned that. I just want to reference one Strathfoyle. I know that the council, Darren Shaban Council, has actually submitted a business case, and I was just looking for an update for that. Maybe you couldn't, you mightn't be able to give me that today. But if if not, perhaps you come back to me on that one. Strathfoyle and Derry. Yeah. Yeah. I certainly know the council are taking forward greenways. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they have submitted um, a business case to the department around funding. That's my understanding. Need to come so back maybe to you could come back to me on that. Um, I'm going to maybe focus now primarily on the A6. Just looking at the document on page 30, where you talk about um, restrictions, COVID-19 restrictions. And you say they may, now it says they may, sort of adversely impact on the delivery of both parts of the scheme in the A6. And it's the Derry to Dungiven and the Dungiven to Dromahoe. Is this on top of delays that we've previously heard about that may happen with regards to COVID, or are you flagging up potential further delays in the time ahead? So in relation to the two schemes mm -hmm. on the ground at the minute, it's yeah. the same position and I think uh, uh, as we, so neither scheme stopped, but we're not quite clear what the overall delay may or may not be at the end. So, we're st so that, that will become clear in the near future. I, I, I think it's safe to say that whilst they never stopped, uh, things slowed down and that may have an impact on the programme. The drum of a call is not affected by COVID. It's, it's one, as I said earlier, it's not a very well-developed scheme and, and, uh, and taking that forward will depend on other factors. But it's, it's the, the two on the ground at the minute. Um, you know, it will become clear in the next you know, number of months whether you know, the, the, the 
the dates that we had targeted for, for completion, whether the contractors will still be able to meet those. But, uh, okay, there were some references made to economic recovery and construction and the role that, uh, that this department can play around economic recovery going forward. And given the 6.5 million we were notified last week in the papers um, was returned for the, it was given for the A6, but it was uh, surrendered. Was, would it not be possible to look at the construction industry run in parallel, for instance, these schemes so that the contractors can employ more people to bring it back up to where it was before we were hit by COVID? So to try to move the schemes uh, quicker, move them forward and allow the, the contractors to employ more people, for instance, uh, as we are coming out of this phase of, uh, of COVID and into the economic recovery basket, that might be one way of taking this forward. So, um, I, I, in terms of the delivery of the schemes on the ground, the programme mm -hmm. is, is determined by the contractor and their capacity to do things in a logical order. So, um, you know, that, 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 that's a difficult one for me to answer. I, I think. Is it uh, worth exploring? Well, uh, you know, I suppose the, the, the position in terms of the contract is, you know, uh, there would be no bar to, you know, finance isn't a bar to the contractor going quicker. We, what we try and do is, is align the finance to the programme. Uh, but if a contractor came forward and said we're going to do, we, we'll do this quicker, then we would but just have to. But if it's been slowed down because of COVID and not having personnel on yeah. the ground. Yeah, but I think it's probably slowed down. But we'll probably then get back up to where we were, you know, the profile that they were on, and I think that's that's where we'd like to do get. You, even though it states here that there may it may adversely impact on the delivery of both schemes. Yeah. You're not really anticipating that that will be the outcome. No, I think I, I, I what we don't know is so. Let, let's say there are two target dates, and I think uh, Ronald's Town to Castle Dawson's probably spring 21 was what we were working on before COVID, and Derry and Given was probably spring 2022. 20, so clearly, what has happened over the last three months is that there has been an impact. So things have slowed down in the programming. So whether the contractor might be able to pick that up again and will reach those targets, or else there might be a, a short delay. Uh, but what we're not clear about is what that is at this stage until we kind of see where we go and if they can get back onto the profile that and they were have on. engagements took place with the contractors. So, they're, they're, so, they're so that not, one of the ways that they may be encouraged to move this fast in the right direction, so yeah. that they're kept on the time frame, may be the employment of more people that may help with the economic recovery as we move out yeah. of this. No, that, this that's phase a fair point, and I think in terms of our contractual dealing with those contracts, those conversations would be ongoing at the minute. Okay, well, it'd be good to get some kind of uh, clarity and an update on that. Just want to pick up on what was mentioned around my boy, because I think it's very disappointing to hear that there only is preliminary work being done in that. You know, we've had the Mills report, we've had, I think, two motions for debate um, during different different mandates here. Um, we've had different recommendations, and we've also been told. Uh, previously in papers that this committee received that Maboy could impact on the A6, the completion um, of the A6. We know that work is needs to be done. So I think that to be told that it's not at an advanced stage yet, given that enforcement orders, there's been so much focus and attention on that and yet trying to get Maboy dealt with. Uh, and not having it impacting on the delivery of the A6, which is deeply concerning, as well as the potential of the environmental impact that it's currently had throughout this this period. And I know there's some different, you know, different opinions with regards to that. But I think that we would need to see some acceleration of that project uh, for my boy to be dealt with in order for it not to act as a barrier to any further work in the completion of the A6. Is there any intention of, of accelerating and advancing what needs done? So, as I said, you know, this, this is not a very advanced project, uh, and that will be... And that's what's disappointing to hear. Maybe we should talk to Mr <laughs> Demers' relative around the yeah. uh, quality manager of this, but, you know, yeah. this is very disappointing to hear, given what we're dealing with in terms of Maboy? So I think there are probably two, two issues here. There's Maboy, which has been dealt with separately by, uh, and there, uh, uh, by the 
presumably NIEA, and then its interaction with this scheme. Uh, I, I, I don't think it's the interaction with the scheme that I'm concerned yeah, about. Yeah, but as so, well as so I, I, I don't. Else. You know, we can probably disconnect that on the basis that uh, you know, the, the, take this is at a, an early stage. I think we've done a, a, a sort of alignment on this, but it has not been detailed, mm -hmm. and, and clearly this is one that you know the, the minister will have to consider going forward in terms of priorities. But the, I, I'm, I'm really stating a fact here that it is at a very early stage. Well, I think that's going to be disappointing for people to hear who have been working, including MLAs in this assembly, <laughs> that have raised this case on a number of occasions for almost a decade, and we're still sitting with the, the problems that we're having with the potential contamination that results from it and the potential impact on the scheme. So I'm hoping it's not left too late before 2022 to get this sorted that this should be accelerated now, but maybe that's something that we'll engage with the Minister on going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Mr Beggs? Thank you. I'd like to, first of all, pick up the issue of maintenance, and uh, that's uh, the maintenance budget. And you've said it there'll be a limited service for routine road maintenance activities, such as pothole repairs and grass cutting. Now, we were told previously that there's going to be two cuts of grass. So, uh, how, how much funding have you got, and how much more would you like? I, I'm aware of some junctions, in particular, they may may need more than than two. Uh, but so just trying to see what what the shortfall is for grass cutting to begin with. Yeah, well, certainly in the past we have done five cuts in urban areas and two in rural, whereas this year and last year it's two urban and two rural. Uh, plus additional cuts at sight lines where there are visibility issues. I mean, that's, that's, that's so what is the for. budget? How much would you would you uh, like? I wouldn't have a figure off off the top of my head. Um, you know how much extra to take to do that. Okay. Could you come back with some information for us? Yeah. Okay. Uh, then, with regard to potholes, um, I think the I and, and and the public were very very frustrated when you'd report maybe a two-inch pothole and somebody would come out and they'd measure it and then decide, no, it's not deep enough. And you yourself have said that if the road opens up and the frost gets in, considerable more damage results. And then eventually we have the four-inch pothole, so somebody comes back a second time with the cost involved of uh, an engineer coming a second time to measure it. Um, so what is the uh, budget this year for pothole repairs and what would you need it to be so that potholes could be repaired when they are uh, at the normal uh, levels? I think there's a 20mm level for repair and a 40mm level for repair. So what is the current budget for potholes and what would you need it to be? Yeah, okay, uh, Having the, the budget broke down across the particular functions, but certainly the service for potholes this year is that we will be picking up uh, potholes at 50mm on all roads. Um, and 20 mil on the higher traffic roads, which is very because you know, in, in, in previous years and some years we haven't been able to do you know, that. It's been 100 mil on the rural roads, um, but this year we're able to pick up 50s on all roads and 20s on the, the busier roads. Yeah, I'm just seeking reassurance because I mean that that's ridiculous. Uh, you had to have a four-inch hole. Yeah before any maintenance would occur uh, on any road. And, and of course, you then had the, the damage to the vehicles, uh, perhaps injury to uh, individuals, uh, and, and the bureaucracy involved with, with everybody running around measuring it multiple times. Um, OK, then, moving on to uh, just the whole balance of the budget. Um, there's a great focus on the, the capital budget where there's a, a ribbon gets cut at some point. Have we got the, the balance right for capital expenditure and maintenance of our assets? What's your professional opinion? Well, the, the structural maintenance, the, you know, the routine maintenance, a routine a resource budget element to all the routine maintenance, so it's not competing with the, the capital, with the major projects. So the major projects really would be competing with the, you know, the 75 million, the, the structural maintenance as opposed to the routine. My, my question is, do you think the overall budget, have we got the balance right? Are we committing too much money to capital projects rather than ensuring that we maintain those capital projects once they're built? 
it's certainly there's difficult decisions to be made. You know, there's there's obviously um, some people would like to do more on the major project side, but that's at the expense of. Are you a civil engineer background yourself, or what's? Yes. The, yes. So from an engineering point of view, are we committing sufficient funds towards our maintenance compared to our capital expenditure? Well, if we look at the Barton report, we need 143 million per year. Um, whereas we're um, getting £75 million pounds this year for structural maintenance. Um, you, you know, it's, so, yes, we could do more on structural maintenance, as we could do across all our functions. Including are our civil servants reluctant to comment the fact that, that we're, not, we're, we're committing too much towards capital rather than maintenance? I mean, professionally, what, what will your professional view be? Is that a yes or a no? Well, I, I, think, I think it's quite a difficult question that for us to answer, because uh, we, you know, as civil servants, we don't determine how this, the, the budget is split at the top level between capital and resource. I, I appreciate that. And, and actually, uh, you have to deal with the hand you're dealt with. So it, in that respect, it's very, very difficult to comment. And then we, we have to try and, uh, and certainly on the resource side, prioritise maintenance within, uh, within the budgets to do the best we can uh, with what we have. Um, so it, it's a it's a it's a difficult one to answer. Do you ever give feedback to ministers as to whether or not the balance is right if you're not doing it publicly to the committee? Well, well certainly we would flag up what we would what we need across the various functions, and then decisions are made in relation how, to how the budgets are are allocated. And I think I think to be fair to ministers, these are difficult choices as well for ministers, um, and, uh, uh, and and certainly these issues, you know, officials would give advice, but choices have to be made, and ultimately it depends on, I suppose, the hand you're dealt with. Okay. I think that's my point. Um, just turning back to the York Gate again, um, and you've indicated in the, your briefing that the. Um, process of, of the, the previous scheme finished in September of the court case which you lost and, and following what Mr Hilly just said, what have you been doing for 10 months? I mean if, if you were a business uh, did you wait 10 months and what you said, you're, you're finalising options for a new procurement strategy for 10 months? So that, that's the position we're in so what we, we this is a, a well developed scheme so in terms of where we are, it's been all through the statutory processes and uh, you know, uh, we, we the minister will uh, have to be given a paper to consider the next steps. And one of the one of that the consideration is how how you might procure this. So you know, that's essentially what we've been doing. We you know, our, we've asked our consultants to review it, our teams reviewed it, and we're finalising that with some external assurance at the minute. So when we go forward to the minister with options, we we can say well, this is robust. Yeah. There was a statement from the Minister on strategic roads and flagship road schemes. And this is, bear in mind, this is a hundred million pounds, maybe a hundred and sixty million pounds, nobody knows exactly, scheme. How come it wasn't mentioned on a, a major statement covering strategic roads and flagship schemes? Uh, so, first of all, York Street's not a flagship scheme. It would be a strategic road scheme. This, this scheme was over both. Yeah. So uh, I, I think that statement was about the development of, uh, you know, development. And as I said, this is a as a fully developed scheme. So uh, it's it's uh, that's maybe uh, an explanation for that. But uh, as I said earlier, I like the scheme actually talked about COVID and the A6. How COVID? Had, so it wasn't just about but, development plans. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I, I'm. Uh, I, I, I've, I've seen this statement, but I haven't got it in front of me, so it's hard to comment on that. But what I would say, as I said to, to your, uh, the member, that the minister has indicated that her commitment to this scheme, and on the record in, in world questions in the House, she's, she's indicated her commitment to that. And you know, amongst all the other uh, schemes, you know, she will be considering the next steps in, in due course. The, um just to follow up then the issue of LED lighting, and you'd indicate their savings in terms of the electricity usage for the LED compared with conventional lighting. On the maintenance side, how much savings is there there? Because my experience of LEDs is they don't go out, you don't have to change bulbs, so, uh, et cetera. So what, what is the overall, have you assessed what the uh, 
business case, the payback period uh, uh, for installing a new LED unit? Yeah, we, we certainly have worked on that. I just don't have the figures to hand. I can certainly come back to you on that because it's, it's a 25-year um, repair cycle for LEDs, and it's three or four for 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 the current one. So certainly, you're, you're right. There is significant. Well, I, I, I was involved in that, and I was previously in Connor's role, so I, I, I can recollect perhaps a sort of seven-year, seven or eight-year return period on the capital investment uh, based on reduced energy. And reduced maintenance because they don't generally go out. Yeah. Um, so, uh, the, the, you know, I, I think we could go back to you on that, <coughs> firm that up. But I think that's my sense of what the return is. Just, just a, a, another comment on LED lighting. Um, certainly, for more of our rural trunk roads, which are unlit, and then you come to a section which has been newly lit with LED lighting. I personally have found my eyes sore at night driving because of the intensity of the light, you're coming from darkness into very, very bright lighting. So is any assessment carried out as a, an appropriate level of lighting uh, for each of the conditions? If you've been operating with a background lighting, you, you become accustomed to it. But when you're going from darkness to brief, intense lighting, it can be painful on the eyesight. So, so have, is there any assessment of that carried out so that we don't actually spend too much money uh, uh, lighting schemes um, and, and unnecessary costs and running costs. Um, well, yeah, I'm assuming you know certainly the, the the levels of light that are needed to light the junction and the spacing of columns and the intensity of the lights uh, are all within the the guidelines that would be used. You know, both here and the Department of Transport. I certainly asked the question, but um, I, I'm expecting there's 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 guidelines in there that we adhere to, but I'll, I'll certainly highlight your, your, your point. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Ms. Skelly, and I remember very comprehensive conversations with yourself and others in relation to the scheme in your constituency whenever it was being rolled out and how difficult it was, but obviously as time has moved on, obviously people have got used to the change in the light <laughs> and the much, I suppose it's purer light as well. Um, from Ms. I was going to make that point, the LED light and uh, uh, it was Minister Kennedy introduced it in my constituency. It was one of the pilot areas and the grief we got. What didn't help that there was an election in the middle of it all. <laughs> but uh, 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 so good luck to those uh, representatives as people adapt to change because it does take uh, quite a while to adapt to the changing um, uh, to the LED lights. You know, it, it is. Uh, uh, and probably you as Minister then picked up some of that as well. But um, they. they so I just want to pick up on, obviously, uh, the A1 is a huge, uh, has a huge impact and necessity from a road safety point of view. So uh, I, I do hope that people are being held to those time frames. And can I ask, at one time, I think we were informed as local representatives that there was some EU funding um, set aside or obtainable at, uh, uh, at one time towards uh, the A1. Is that still secured? Because I remember during the three-year hiatus, if you like, when there was no assembly, uh, the road service personnel made the point to us that there was no one championing in their cause, you know, uh, uh, to, to uh, ensure that would happen. So I don't know the answer to that question, but I'll come back to you. But certainly there, there, uh, there are EU grants for the development of schemes mm -hmm. up to uh, various points, but I, I'm not actually quite sure today whether the A1 is included in that. But if, if you like, we'll come back to you on that one. Uh, that'd be useful. I, I'm, I'm very clear that there, there was, but whether it was around the development or you know, or, or the installation of the scheme, I, I'm not clear. So I would welcome some okay. clarity on that. Uh, the, um, the, as a member of the Police Board, we had a recent presentation from P PS and I around road safety. I'm just picking up a, from Cahill there. You know, sadly, a number of people have lost their lives over uh, recent uh, weeks. But they, I think the findings from the PS and I were around um, ro roads. Um, you know, the second highest cause was si um, still driver habit. You know, so the, the education in terms of you know the public messaging around that is still vital. That there's still a budget set aside for that, and I know it had suffered drastic cuts over recent times. So maybe you could give us some insight onto the thinking there. Um, the rural roads had a particular um, 
uh, causation whenever there was analysis of a number of the accidents. And uh, it was around you know, some of the verges and the turning lanes, etc. So I just wonder, in terms of setting your priorities, how much uh, communication do you have with police and those analysts in terms of some of the causation of accidents and whether or not road safety schemes? And I'm sure anyone who has a rural constituency will know how hard it is to get rural roads upgraded because it tends to be the local farmer pulls the car out of the edge. And therefore, we don't have the history of accidents to the same extent unless someone is unfortunately injured or killed. Uh, so I just wonder, uh, uh, sorry, the other bit that I have a major problem and concern about is the speed limits on a number of our rural roads, because people don't seem to know the highway code any longer. And it's my understanding that where there are street lights, there's an automatic, unless there's an exemption has been agreed by road service, that's a 30 mile limit, period. Uh, uh, and so how are we getting those messages across? I know enforcement is an entirely different matter. And then we have uh, where there have been some rural businesses built up and, you know, business one side of the road and they car park at the other on a 60 mile zone. So I just want in terms of looking at the regulations or the legislation around uh, speed, how often is that reviewed, you know, so it can be updated with the change in environment and landscape? You know, across uh, the north. Yeah, yeah. No, we're pointing. Yeah, well, certainly the engineering, as John said, it's only one of the three strands. You've got the education and enforcement as well. Certainly, we work very closely with PSNA because we've said that uh, accidents uh, and right, that it's it's injury accidents do um, are, are a key part of that process. We do get information um, from PSNA on accidents to see is there any um, factors relevant to, to to what we're considering. In relation to streetlights, yeah, you're, you're right. That it's, it's it's 30 mile an hour unless there's if it's not 30 mile an hour, we have to put up repeater signs on the streetlights or uh, periodically to say what the speed limit is because the default is 30. If there's none of these uh, repeater signs, you know, so um, certainly we do work closely with them, and, and an accident is a key factor that that we consider, um, and you know, it's all part of the assessment process. Um, you know, so on rural roads, you know, if there's a place that you know that ha has a, if there's a location where there are, there, uh, there are a number of accidents, we do have collision remedial programs, so they will certainly move up in terms of priority. But the, the difficulty is, chair, you know, unless you look at the hedge and say where the hedge has been pulled out, or pushed out, or flattened, there, there's no accident history reported with the police because the local farmers pulled, or some people come along and pull the the car out, and yet we have huge swathes of country roads uh, where there's no hedges, <laughs> but there's no accident history. Yeah. So you know, a wee bit of flexibility in yeah, the right. Yeah, but when there's no accident history, then there's no. We don't know what the causes of the accidents are. You, you well, know. it's usually speed and flying around the corners, of course. Yeah. But uh, but uh, they that goes back to your three A's around, uh, yeah. around that. But it's also about, you know, the road, uh, you said at the outset uh, about the budget for uh, road safety schemes. I remember meeting the di divisional manager a couple of years back um, for the southern area. And I think we were told there were some 600 traffic common measures applied for or in the system, but there's only the money to pay for one per year. So yeah, yeah the, the schemes you know definitely we have a lot of schemes you know it'll be the same as the as, as the schools and the part time twenties there's a lot of schemes in our books that we would like to be doing but again we can only deliver what the funding allows and and there's no um, uh, work in partnership with other agencies I mean I know it's a statutory function but sometimes there are pots of money around you know to work work in partnership with community groups and others that might have access. For areas that are, are a major concern, has there ever any work done on that? Well, certainly, we're very receptive to anybody coming. <laughs> come with money in your pocket, isn't? Uh, yeah. uh, you, you know, I've come across it more in the you know in the development side and bigger roads. You know, not aware of too much certainly coming to, to deliver safety schemes locally. But Chair, I think my, what what I was trying to do, and it was a very difficult and long-winded way, was say uh, about some bespoke. <clears throat> flexibilities in and around some areas uh, where there is a standard roads policy, but <clears throat> circumstances have changed where they need a wee bit of flexibility outside of the main regulations. And is there a fit anywhere within 
the regulations or legislation to allow that to happen. In, in relation to... And for example, we have a cheese factory, for example, outside Portadown. The car parks at the other side of the road. It's a really bad bend. There's hundreds of staff have to cross the road at early hours of the morning and night. The winter time it's dark. And they put up their own, you know, they brought in those big street lights on a big gadget thing and put them up. But they can't get a 30 mile speed limit or any road safety sign. So because it's a 60 mile, nothing can be done. The first point, they would even build a bridge. There's nothing can be done because it's a 60 mile limit, uh, limit on the road. You, you will certainly, as development changes along a road, that, that, that's the key criterion for speed limits. Uh, it's the level of development on, on the roadside and certainly if there's you know, factories and there's more development, we should be working in, in parallel with that to look at that. Oh, I, I'm very well aware of trying to get ten, you know, so many ten houses on each side of the road within a 200 metre line in order to get street lights. And when you live around the lock shore where there is no SSI, it ain't ever going to happen. So uh, I, I, I'm just pleading, I suppose, for some level of flexibility in around that in terms of, uh, and I'm happy to speak outside of the meeting at a later stage to yourselves in relation to that. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Boylan, you want to come back yeah, on, again? On, no, on a, a different matter, Chair, just in relation to the point Ms. Anderson brought up uh, about the F4 and the delays. and the, like, You get a good news story and then the next thing you, you follow the process. Thank but you. My main question is about the Audit Office report in December of last year and the causation of some of the unconstrained legal challenges planned and issues. Then there was a, a number of, I'm just looking at it here, there's a number of recommendations arising from that. So just John, can you remember expand a wee bit on where you are with that? Because I, mean, I, do, I do say it. I mean, we, we're okay. in some big projects. Besides the budget issue, we can argue every day of the week. But there's still, you know, planning issues. There's still procurement issues, and they've made a number of recommendations. And me and Mr. Hildage is on it on the, that committee. So we got a report there recently. I'm just wondering where's the department in all of that to try and move some of those those things on, or the recommendations arising from it. So there, there's a hearing of the Public Accounts Committee on the 8th of July to, to take that forward, and we'll be discussing that, no doubt, with that committee. No problem, because there's a number of capital projects, A5, A6, yeah. the hub and all was mentioned in that report. And I mean, I, I think we need to learn from, from that report. I just wanted to bring it up for you. Yeah, so so there, there'll be obviously an outcome of that through the Public Accounts Committee, and we'll be engaging with the Sorry. committee okay. on that. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, just a couple of things now, just for clarity. With regards to the £8 million pounds for the LED um, uh, replacement, um, how is that money distributed then across the divisions? Is it unequally or is it on a, on a scheme by scheme basis just to, for, well, for the just incoming the, year? The, the budgets are really only confirmed, so we're just looking at all that at, the, at, the, at this minute, um, you know, just to, to see how we distribute budgets across divisions and even within divisions. So, uh, I, I'm just not in a position to answer that question at this moment in time, okay. but it's something we'll be addressing very quickly. Okay. Do you, on what stage do you think you're likely to to, to know that? Because obviously we're we're obviously well in year now too. Yeah. No. No. It'll be it's it'll, it'll be a, it's a matter of weeks. I would have thought because you know we're looking now. Um, you know, typically at this time of year we would have council meetings and we need to try and get programmes developed and finalised and work orders issued. So it, it, it's a priority for us. It's something we need to be doing. Okay. okay. And then just regard with the four million pounds for the park and ride scheme, how many schemes is that likely to be able to deliver um, in this incoming year? So um, are we shovel ready on some of these schemes? So just to maybe give it a bit of context. So we we have a a, a long program for a number of years, which will maybe over 20 sites and will deliver 6,000 spaces and the Minister's allocated 4 million for this year. It's still actually to decide our priorities but it's likely to be, you know, in terms of maybe five or six sites at various stages. Some may be land purchase, some may be design and, 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 but it will depend on how she determines her priorities for that um, and we'll work our way through that in, in very shortly hopefully. Okay, I can. And then, obviously, then there's four million pounds has been allocated for intelligent transport systems at the um, Traffic Information Control Centre. Can you tell us a little bit about what that may entail and what that's likely to deliver? Um, I can't share this man. I'm not sure the, the program, but there's a program behind that, but I just don't have that detail to hand. Okay, um, so we'll, we'll follow up on all, on all of those. And then finally, it's just in relation to, I suppose, a, a bugbear, I guess, of, of, a, of a lot of us and our constituents is in relation to um, utilities. And um, I 
suppose the in some places the devastation that they can cause across our, our footways and and um, road network and really suppose a comment from yourselves in relation to you know how this could be done better and i suppose a, a, a better result i suppose really for for road users and footpath users as um, we move out of those types of schemes yeah, can i ask is it the is it what they leave behind is this at the concern or is it the disruption during? Well, no, it's really what they leave behind because obviously they're, they're there for a purpose and, that, and that's, that can be a short-term problem, but there's a longer-term problem and the consequence of the mess that's left. Um, and obviously for for yourselves then to, um, to clear up or to try to address further down the road. Yeah, no, certainly because there's two elements to that. It's it's the work planning as they do it is certainly very challenging because you, you know we, we look at different utilities going in there and they just in a particular area and there's a lot of work going on in different locations at the one time and causes a lot of uh, disruption at a time. Uh, and but certainly in terms of what they leave behind, you, you know we do have uh, regimes in place in terms of inspection, inspecting what they do. Um, you, you know so. Uh, and we do checks uh, both on the materials, you know. So we do keep an eye on on, on what what they do. So I'd like to think uh, I'm ha happy to l look at individual <laughs> locations. But well, I think you need, you know yourself that whenever you whenever you disrupt a, a a road or you disrupt any footpath, it's never going to be as it was because you're leaving a, a track along the centre, um, and that will then lead in itself to to issues of tripping and so on further down the line. But apart from anything else, it's incredibly unsightly. Um, where you are you're patching as opposed to, you know, resurfacing a full footpath or a full road width. Yeah, as much as we would like to get utilities to do the full um, you, you know, the full width, it's it's, it's within their, their rights to do what they do. You know, they have the the, the legal right to, to do that, to take out, put in what they need to do and to reinstate. But, but yes, it needs to be done properly, and certainly if there's any defects up here, you know, there is a maintenance period, so if it's not done right, um, you know, we go back to them and it has to be redone. But of, co of course they reinstate to a certain degree, but they don't <laughs> reinstate to the, the standard of really that I suppose we, we would all wish that they would, you know, so, um, but maybe that's a conversation that we, we may need to have at a, at a future, future session, but uh, anyone else wish to raise anything? At this stage, you're quite content. No, and I thank you very much for your time this morning, and no doubt we'll we'll have a further conversation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, members. Anything which perhaps maybe we may need to follow up um, was a point that Mrs. Kelly made with regards to. The policy around review of speed limits that we may want to maybe raise that um, with with the department because I'm, okay. I'm sure all of us have asked at various stages for reviews of speed limits within our, our, our area and we're all well aware of the policy but mm -hmm. I suppose it's about the review of, of that policy. Yeah. Um, anyone any other issues you want to raise with regards to this session? No. Okay. Thank you. And let Mr. Beggs into his secret that um, you don't actually cut the ribbon. It's all. A <laughs> it's just for the photograph, I'm afraid. It's, it's reused again they and again. To, they used to. No. <laughs> okay, moving then on to correspondence at um, page 34 and also table papers at page 8. Um, at page 66, 56, we have correspondence from the Belfast Public Car Taxi drivers and they're requesting to brief the committee on issues arising from the collapse of the industry due to the COVID um, health crisis. Um, this has been something which we've discussed at every um, committee meeting that we've had, and obviously the, the road hauliers as well, and we're, we've all received probably updated information with regards to um, at the lack of assistance there as well. So we tend to be going round in circles with regards to this. So it's really about how we want to deal with this particular piece of correspondence, whether we feel that we want to hear from the taxi drivers, or whether we're content that we may um, get the same response from the departments if we do the same round of correspondence. And it's really just to get some indication from, from yourselves as to how you want to deal with that. You know, do we want to raise this as a, an issue in the Assembly directly, or do we want to, to wait until we, we hear from the taxi drivers? And I'm open to suggestions. Mr Boylan. Yeah, just to the Chair. I mean, Chair, yeah, I have, uh, like most of us, I mean, we have a responsibility for scrutiny once of the department, but also to 
to try and protect the interests of the sector itself. And I have received a number of, of lobbying from both the taxi industry, driving instructors, haulage industry, and I, I feel they have been left out. And I have received a, a, a response there from the Economy Minister. And she has clearly outlined roles and responsibilities. And I, I would like to see us, um, if we could, consider uh, a motion to the floor to, to outline clearly whose responsibility is and try, most importantly, to, to try and address the gaps. Because none of these groups, the haulage industry is not getting any help. We, we've seen different people in here who who's made presentations to us. And I mean, if you look at it, I just want to read this out because it's part of the, the Minister's response to me. I mean, it clearly outlines in Schedule 1 and 3 of the Budget Act 2020 the allocation of funding is responsibility of the Department of Infrastructure, and that's for support for transport services, including grants in respect of rail and road pasture. So it's clearly their whole responsibility. Now, I'm not arguing the toss. All I want to do is get support from this committee to, to bring a motion to the floor to ensure that the haulage industry and the taxis industry and guidelines are sent to the driving instructors that we think can tie some of that in. I think we need a broader discussion because I, I think it's just been passed around and it's our responsibility, I think, to try and protect some of these sectors out there. So uh, uh, I would like I'd like maybe the other members to, to support that a motion yeah. to the well, I, I mean, I think we, we've got to the stage now. We have exhausted the system um, with correspondence and, and obviously questions. And um, I mean, I think we've all received correspondence individually from um, the taxi drivers, hauliers, and and driving instructors. And I think it's very, it's been very poor. Certainly, the communication, particularly with driving instructors, given the fact that they're key stakeholders in. Um, in all of this now, perhaps their financial situation may be slightly different. I'm not sure, and I know we've heard various um, uh, direction being given to, to you know, regarding depending on whether they're self-employed and so on as well. Um, but we welcome other members' comments with regards to maybe moving this higher to a committee motion, Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I think these, these sections of our, our economy have been forgotten about and they're getting passed from pillar to post um, and also add on to the private uh, bus and, and coach industry who are very heavily reliant upon tourism trade and really 2020 has been a, a write-off for them. <coughs> they've got their loan payments to, to, to make, they've got insurance to do, they've also got their uh, the furloughing schemes going to run out and there's real concern and, and around the driving instructors, you know, I got a response from the Minister saying, well, my department is responsible for regulating the approved driving instructor industry through DVA. It does not employ ADIs in the capacity of delivering driving instruction. The department has no remit to suspend their services or depend when they can return to work. So they're just left with no guidance at all. So I think we need to find some way. Someone needs to own this and help the, this industry because this is, this, is, this is shameful. And yet, the similar this, the similar organisation in England has been very clear in the guidance that they've given yeah. to, to driving instructors. Yeah. Um, Mr. Beggs, <coughs> the, the, these sections uh -huh. of our, our transport infrastructure, which is which is essential, um, has been battered between yeah. different departments. Yeah. I think the motion should be directed at the executive office to coordinate government departments. Uh, to pick up areas which have not been covered, and that would include these here, because the, the difficulty is uh, both ministers can bat back and forward. Uh, Miss Kimmins, yeah, chair, it's just to agree with um, with what's been said. I think, you know, and as as others have said, we've all been contacted by the the various groups, and you know, it's just not good enough that nobody is 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 taking responsibility. And okay, I know there's guidelines and there's. Um, I suppose limitations in departments, but the shared responsibility, in my opinion, here, you know, there's definitely elements of both. So it's so important that that both the departments are working together on this to find kind of common ground to say how can we help them. We can't just say, you know, there's not it's not my job, Shane. You know, that's it. It's you know we can't do anything about it. Um, so I would definitely support a motion. I think I think we can't. Leave, like, these are these are key services within our economy. And, and will have an important role in the recovery. Um, you know, people can't get access to driving tests, for an example. You know, that's a, that's a major um, impact as we go forward. So, 
um, you know, it, it's just not good enough. So I just agree with with all the speakers and and to give my support. Miss Anderson. Yeah, well, look, we have all I think wrote to the minister, putting questions, questioned her here, questioned her on the floor. This has been kicked around. Is it the economy? Is it the infrastructure? We're here now from the economy minister, quite clearly stating that this is the remit from the infrastructure committee. I feel we have exhausted all our roles of scrutiny uh, that we have, and the only other option open to us. I think if we ask the executive, it's like somebody somewhere needs to do something about this, but it still doesn't have a home. You know, the taxi industry are apoplexic at this stage with annoyance. The haulage industry the same. When I've looked here at the issue, and we raised it around driving instruction, instructions, uh, instructors. We've been told here that driving instruction is not specifically covered in the COVID-19 recovery plan, nor were driving instruct instructors specifically listed um, in any of the schedules to the in the health protection. And they went on to say that they weren't they, they weren't told that they had to suspend many of the driving instructors thought that they should. And then they go on to then say, but those then workers who work up close is going to get advice. So I read that and thought, that's as clear as mud with regards to for driving instructors as to what they should or should be doing. Should they have stopped? According to this, they weren't actually instructed to do so. Um, and But they're going to get advice as to when they can come back, but they're not actually in any of the stages. I think there are so many of those people out there, whether they're haulage sector, people who work in that sector, you know, taxi drivers, all of that. And look, they do have a relationship with this department. So whether it is by way of a collective motion or a motion that's chair that you take by way of trying to shape the, the wording of it to try to make sure that we all can collectively support it, that we could be looking at that. But I think we need to do something more than what we've done because these people out here are out there are coming at us and they expect us to be able to provide them with the person who's responsible for developing the scheme. And at this stage, they feel they've been kicked around like a political football. Okay, Mr. Buchanan. Yeah, just, yeah, just to follow on from our comments, I'm happy enough of the chair. I presume that's suitable that she can do that. The authorization of the committee to pull a, a motion together. Well, what we do is the, the committee staff then would draft suitable wording okay, and then yeah. we would circulate That's it to be agreed out of everyone's hands. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. Okay. Chair, just go back to the and I appreciate Mr. Begg's point, but I have a letter here, many people get a copy of it. It's clearly identified whose responsibility it is. I I don't mind if any member wants to stick in the chamber on whatever point they want to raise. But clearly we as a committee have a scrutiny role of this department and to protect the rights of those people out there in that sector. And I would like to see a motion towards that. Members will get a chance to amend or, or agree or disagree. But primarily the issue here lies with DFA. So and my colleagues had the right if we go back Miss the, the Finance Minister indicated a number of weeks ago what way to go forward. We said we would support whatever measures or if there was a proposal put forward for costings or funding. So, I would like to see a motion on the floor because we have a responsibility to do that. So. Well, I think I'm, I'm quite clear that we're going round in circles in all of this, and I think yeah. probably we need yeah. to do something uh, in yeah, order to absolutely. have a, a proper conversation. Um, so if if you're agreed, then Cathy will yeah. um, send out something probably tomorrow or Sorry. Friday. Friday. Yeah, something tomorrow or Friday. Okay. To get it agreed by Monday, so we can get it into the business committee. Sure. Yeah. That's okay. okay. Um, moving then, just with then with regards to um, the Belfast public hire taxi drivers, um, perhaps it might be useful then for us for the for you to go back to them actually and just to say like this is what we're suggesting to do, yeah. and if they could maybe send us a briefing paper uh, sure. or so Obviously, comments. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm happy to do that. Okay. Moving then to page 57, with correspondence from the minister regarding a legislative consent motion driver licensing statute provision for one year license renewals for group two drivers. Um, this was emailed out for your approval um, as it's being um, it's been um, sort of really rushed through the assembly due to tight time scales. The bill was to have been introduced in Westminster on Tuesday. However, it's been delayed until tomorrow, so the plenary debate. Um, should be scheduled for the 7th of July and will be dealt with at next week's meeting. So, okay. okay. Um, page 60, we've got correspondence from the department um, from the meeting of the 3rd of June. Do you any comments on that? No. Um, correspondence, page 68, from Mobile UK, and that's just a request to brief the committee on Mobile Action Plan and also a number of other issues in relation to planning reform. 
Um, if members are content, perhaps we would, could um, ask um, staff maybe to contact them and maybe set up a Zoom meeting with some members who may be available just to have a, an informal discussion. Okay. Um, page 69, I've been invited to take part in and attend a, law, a live online panel discussion um, of the Institute of Civil Engineers report. Now, um, I'm unable, this is going to take place on Monday the 29th at 12.30. Unfortunately, I'm unable to um, attend that. But if other members would like to indicate to um, the staff if, if they wish to to be in attendance at that, that would be useful. Maybe we send a note out to see if anyone's interested in being there. Unfortunately, I can't do that. And then we have table page, a uh, table paper to page nine, with departmental response, just in relation to some questions that members had with regards to the LCM. So, if you just want to, to note those, members content then just to deal with the correspondence as Great. noted. Okay, Great. thank you. Um, page 72, um, the draft forward work programme to the end of um, the week ending the 8th of, for the 8th of July. Um, I suppose really it's, it's my intention maybe to look for the committee to look to have a, a mini inquiry in the autumn and it would be useful just to seek views um, of top, for particularly sort of topics. Um, from members and if you could perhaps go back to committee staff by um, next Thursday and it's really just to enable us to have a discussion um, on the 8th of July in order to ask research to do um, some preliminary um, research around some of the topics. We may want to look at road safety or decarbonisation. There's, there's lots of different things that we may, may have um, some thoughts on and it would be useful then to have a discussion at that meeting if you're content to do that. Okay. Yep. And, and also um, looking at a strategic planning day. Obviously, we were unable to, to do that um, due to COVID. And again, if we could do that sort of early September as well, just to, to plot our way um, forward. Uh, and we may have more clarity in relation to site visits and so on, on at that stage as well, if members are content. Moving then to any other business, does anyone have anything else they wish to raise? Mr Boylan? Yes, Chair, just in relation to the capital budget was announced, I want to find out the uh, from NIW in particular, um, the wastewater treatment works that will have their capacity issues addressed this year. Just a wee bit, we update on that on that issue because there's some capacity issues out there for some of the room. And I'll send an email if you need for the clarification to count the order. I mean, cer certainly, I think we'll need to schedule another meeting with Northern Art Water um, once we come back in the, in the autumn uh, as well. So, okay. Members content? Mr Muir. Yeah, I got correspondence from uh, Rise Hydrogen and Right Bus wanting to make a deputation to the committee, so I just forward that on maybe. Yeah. Yes, I, I, that as well. yes I, I received I received that as well, and obviously um, we had had a discussion with them when we met yeah. at the launch of the hydrogen bus, and I know as a consequence of that, the committee staff had been um, speaking to them, speaking to Right Bus directly about arranging a meeting, and that had been in the schedule, and obviously had changed as a consequence of, of where we are. So I'm um, obviously happy for um, staff to revisit that again. I've, I forward that, and it will be in the pack again, obviously for next week. Okay. Um, members, any other? Oh, sorry. sorry I so it's, just see a you quick, there. it's only a quick point. Um, whenever we had the briefing a couple of weeks ago from Andrew um, Murray. Murray, and I had, I had asked about the possibility, and, and um, Mr. Buchanan has raised this, I suppose, as well, and in relation to his own area, about looking at extending times for parking on street parking to try and help businesses again. And it goes back to the point that, that uh, he's made this morning. So it's just to see, could we explore that further, even if it means a 30 minute ticket lasts an hour or something like that. But I just think it's, I know there's uh, there's conflicting issues, I suppose when the parking charges were suspended there for a while, it was effective, but then there was issues around people parking all day and things like that, which which took off spaces. So it's really just to try and help the, the local businesses get back on their feet again, but encourage people to go into those areas. And I'm thinking of my own area there at Hill Street and Uri, just to, to let people have a wee bit more time that they're incentivised to, to stay longer in those kind of areas. So is it something we can still explore? I know the parking charges are being reinstated now in the next week. So. Okay, well, maybe if you're content, we can um, yeah. maybe ask what consideration is being given. Yeah, I think it's, it's asked what consideration is given. I think just need to be careful around, you know, the whole future is about tackling climate emergency and about encouraging use of public transport and active travel. So to then be then seeking to encourage more people to drive into towns and city centres by 
waiving parking charges or, or changing the pricing is something we need to be hesitant about as well. Yeah, and I think also sometimes actually some of the um, shops were quite happy with um, yes. sort of movement of, of cars and traffic as well. I suppose I, I totally take your point, Andrew. I, I, majority of people who have contacted me, I suppose, in terms of parking are people with mobility issues and things like that. So it's about that rush of trying to get back to the car in time and I know in Uri we are, are like there's quite over jealous uh, traffic attendance to be right it's a huge issue <laughs> and it's probably in other areas yeah. too but it Absolutely. really is a major problem well, suppose, and yeah. driving people away from the town centres. Yeah. I suppose there is consideration obviously the fact that, you know, that there are queues now at, at yeah. shops as well that's, so you're maybe not going to be able to nip in as quickly as you would that, have done that, in the past. That's the point yeah no if we could look at it anyway it'd be great. Mr. I think Beggs. we need to be very careful we don't blame overzealous traffic attendants. They're doing their jobs. The question is, is the limits that are being set for them to enforce correct? Well, that's, that's uh, something. Okay. Yeah, right. It's about we're, how we frame that, obviously. We're, so. we're listening to you, right? We're listening to you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank um, you. Um, just advise you, just as you're leaving, just to, be, to maintain your social distancing and also to remove all your own papers and um, the water jugs and glasses and so on from the meeting room when you leave. The next meeting of the committee will take place on the 1st of July at 10 a.m. in this room. Um, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed.